was 19, I was married with two kids. My oldest son, Jacob, was two, and the younger boy, Tyler, was about one. We all lived in an apartment in a tiny little town. There were four apartments in our building. My mom lived in the front left-hand apartment, and we lived in the back upstairs one. We lived there peacefully, until this night. You see, in this tiny little town, there's a woman, Leslie, who suffers from many mental illnesses, including schizophrenia. She generally doesn't like people and prefers to be left to her own devices. She often wanders the streets at all hours and seemed to particularly hate my younger son. If we passed her on the street, she would stare at him and burst into a curse word fueled rant. We would just ignore her and try our best to continue on our way. So, now that you know some backstory, let's get into what happened on this particular night. The boys had been in bed for a couple of hours, and my husband and I had just gotten to settling in. I feel like I had just closed my eyes when I heard a noise from the front of the apartment. It sounded kind of like a toy box had been dumped, so I assumed one of the boys had gotten up. I hopped out of bed to see what they were up to. If one knew I was up, the other would soon be up as well, and that would result in a very long night. When I walked out of my room, though... I was shocked to realize the front door was standing wide open, silhouetted by the porch light, and hunched at my boy's bedroom door was Leslie. She was muttering to herself, something about killing the little demon child. In one hand, she held a screwdriver, as she used both hands to jiggle the knob. Luckily, the boy's door stuck when it was humid out, so there was a trick to opening the door. I knew and understood that Leslie was just sick, and not in her right mind, but I wasn't sure how to handle this whole situation. And clearly I didn't want her to turn her aggravated attention to me, but I also knew I needed to get her away from my boy's door. And she just kept jiggling the handle and muttering about the demon child. I should mention at this point that Tyler was and is the most joyful kid I've ever known, and Jacob has always been more quiet and thoughtful, while Tyler is loud and smiles brighter than the sun. He'll do things just to make someone else happy. Jacob also thrives on making people happy, but he does it in smaller ways that you don't realize until you do. I was sure there was literally no possible reason for her irrational hatred of Tyler. I was sure it was just her mental illness speaking, but it was insane nonetheless. Luckily, my mom happened to be walking home from the bar right across the street from the apartments, and she heard the crash, which I now know was my front door being smashed open. My mom had lived in this town longer than I had, and had dealt with Leslie's outburst several times, so while I was trying to decide how to distract her from my boy's room without getting stabbed, my mom was creeping up the stairs to my apartment. My mom stepped into the apartment, and Leslie turned to look at her. My mom asked her what she was doing, and she just burst out crying and kept telling my mom she had to kill him. They kept telling her that she had to. By this point, my husband had woken up and called for help. The cops came and escorted her away. They took her to her sister's house down the road. But very fortunately, her sister is under no illusions about her sister's condition. She knew that Leslie only got bad when she stopped taking meds and began drinking again, so, Leslie was taken to the hospital to get her stabilized and back on her meds. The family apologized, and we moved before she was released from the hospital. The boys slept in my room until we did move, and for a while after that as well. Last I knew, Leslie is doing okay now. They think Tyler set her off, because she resembled a baby the family had once lost. When she saw him, she decided her meds weren't working because she was hallucinating the baby still being alive, so she stopped taking them, then began drinking because she couldn't deal with seeing this baby everywhere. Maybe that's crap. Maybe it's true. I don't know. We haven't seen her since, and her family works hard to keep people from spreading stories. Tyler is 18 now and still full of sunshine. Jacob is 19. We have two more kids and have been married for 20 years, but this is still the scariest night of my life. I'm forever grateful for my mom defusing the situation and that darn sticky door.
I'm sure either Leslie or I would be dead if she had actually managed to get it open. Hi, y'all. I recently found this subreddit and thought it would be the perfect place to share a frightening stalker experience I had when I was in college. This was particularly traumatizing for me, as I had just started to recover from eight years of sexual abuse from the ages of five to thirteen at the hands of my aunt's husband. This happened back in 2012. I had recently graduated from high school and was attending community college to save some money. In October, I was hired as a team member at a Chick-fil-A located about three minutes away from my house. In the same plaza, there were other businesses, including a Burlington coat factory my mom and I would occasionally shop at. I worked from 5.30am to 2pm, and in the weeks following, I started to get to know some of the morning regulars, who we would serve more frequently. Most of them were very kind, just stopping by for their morning caffeine fix. One of the regulars we had, though, was a pair of gentlemen that would stop a couple of times a week in the morning together. One of them was older and very polite. The other was a short, balding man that always gave me the creeps whenever he came in. His name was Esteban. After a while, I started to notice that Esteban would come in more frequently by himself and only ever order a small black coffee. On one visit while I was at the register, he mentioned that he worked at the Burlington in the plaza. He also very casually threw in that I looked very familiar to him, and he must have seen me shopping there before. He offered up his personal discount if I ever wanted something special. Although I found his comment a little disconcerting, it wasn't all that out of the ordinary for someone to recognize a customer elsewhere, especially since both businesses were located in the plaza, or so I thought. I continued to serve him his coffee with a small smile and pushed it out of my mind, but decided to avoid shopping at Burlington from then on. As the months progressed, Esteban continued to come in almost every morning. Some of my co-workers started to tease me about my boyfriend, who would come in and ask for me specifically, by name. Whenever I wasn't there, he would be rather upset and wouldn't order anything they said. After I heard those comments, I began to feel very uneasy. My mom doesn't drive, and one afternoon she asked me to take her to Burlington to shop for some gifts, as she was flying to visit family back home in Honduras. She usually managed to find a good bargain there. I felt my stomach twist in knots. I silently hoped and prayed on our quick drive that Esteban would be nowhere in sight. As we looked through the racks, my mom decided to go her own way, and eventually we separated. While I looked through the junior section, I suddenly had a gnawing feeling that someone was watching me. Each time I would look over my shoulder, though, there was no one there. I was feeling very silly, until I decided I needed to use the restroom. I walked down past the sheets and comforters to the small, dingy hallway leading to the restrooms with no one else in sight. As I exited after doing my business and rounded the corner, I froze. Esteban was not so conspicuously organizing some comforter sets about ten feet in front of me with his back half-turned. I had seen him, but I was sure he hadn't caught a glimpse of me yet. I quickly darted in the opposite direction to avoid any interaction with him and hurried back to my mom. She was ready to check out by then, and we left promptly. I had two days of class after that incident, and after leaving class early one day, I decided to stop by the mall on my way home to pick up a birthday gift from my dad. As I walked towards the J.C. Penny I was there to shop at, I happened to look up from my phone only to realize Esteban was leaning up against the railing directly ahead of me. Watching intently as I walked closer, stalking me with his eyes like prey, I averted my gaze and made a beeline for the Victoria's Secret just a few feet past him, 
I thought that there was no way he would have followed me in there. I was very wrong. He pushed off from the railing and tailed me throughout the store. I stopped to look through some items and watched him from the corner of my eye. He was toying with a pair of lacy panties, watching to make sure I didn't leave his sight. That's when it dawned on me. This man had followed me, from campus to the mall. He knew I had left early and had tracked me the entire time. I picked something absent-mindedly, trying to push down the paralyzing fear I felt, and headed towards the register. He followed suit, but was cut off by another customer who managed to slide in line behind me before he could catch up. Since there were line dividers in place, he couldn't leave the line. I paid hastily and bolted out of the store, running as fast as I could away from Victoria's Secret. I hid for over an hour in the Sears on the opposite end of the mall. I was terrified of leaving and finding him outside another store. I finally picked up enough courage to tell an associate what had happened, and he offered to call security. The security guard escorted me back to my car, and I drove home staring into my rearview mirror for any signs he could be following me. I had to work the next morning, though, and without missing a beat, Esteban came in for his morning coffee. He was not happy this time, though. His face was contorted into a dark, angry scowl. Luckily, I was filling our ice buckets in the kitchen area behind the counter. I could see him through the small window in the door, craning his neck over the registers trying to find me, muttering under his breath. I felt hot tears welling up in my eyes and slid down the wall to the floor. My morning manager, my now husband, noticed my distress and came over to me, asking if I wasn't feeling well. I couldn't hold it any longer. Through childlike sobs, I unloaded on him everything that had happened with Esteban over the past few months. He looked very concerned and told me to wait in the office while he made a call. When he came back some time later, the restaurant owner was with him. They had called the police and made it very clear to Esteban that he wasn't welcome in the restaurant any longer due to several complaints of harassment from multiple female employees. He tried to come in a few times after that, but was always met with my husband at the door telling him very forcefully to leave, or he would call the cops. With the help of the officer that responded as well, I filed a restraining order against him and have not seen him since then. We still live in the same area, but I absolutely refuse to shop at the Burlington where he worked. I lived and worked in Saudi Arabia for a few years, back in the mid-90s. I had some crazy experiences there, but this one was the most frightening. I was in a supermarket buying groceries when this man started following me around. I ignored him as best as I could as he tried to talk to me, kept calling me Halloween Habibi, sweet baby, and kept asking me if I was Lebnani but there was something menacing about how he was looking at me. Then he got on his phone and was talking very intently, all the while watching me and following me around. This was a big Walmart-sized store, so he was definitely making an effort, and this went on for about 20 minutes. I was very nervous at this point and checked out with my items and had started to leave. Just outside the door and into the corridor of smaller stores, very common in Saudi supermarkets, there was a group of between 10 to 15 angry-seeming men who all crowded around me and started talking to me in Arabic. I played dumb and kept my eyes down, mumbling about my husband, hoping they would think I was not a lone woman and let me go. People were walking right past and working hard not to look at this threatening group surrounding a lone woman. Just then, my amazing driver, a tiny guy of about five foot two, bowled through the group and grabbed my arm. He started to yell at me angrily, and then the men. Wife, I've been waiting. Ah, you're so slow and stupid. And what are you all doing, you sinful creeps? He threatened to call the Mutawa, religious police. The men fell back and looked ashamed and confused. Abdul dragged me out of there, talking loudly about how stupid and useless I was. 
I just went with him and kept my head down as I tried not to drop my groceries for nerves. We got into the car. He turned around from the driver's seat to look at me and let out a big, deep breath. He looked terrified. He said he was so frightened for me. He had seen men gathering in the car park and knew something bad was about to go down. He said they had been talking about taking me. They thought I was Lebanese, and there was some very bad blood with Lebanon at the time. I'm ethnically Romani. I pass as white in western countries, but pass as Middle Eastern in the east. Apparently, I have a very Lebanese nose. He told me there had been some kidnappings in the last month, with the victims found burned alive in tires right outside of the city. Abdul was a shit shooter, but he had gone whiter than me, as he told me all of this. He was shaking and genuinely afraid, so I don't think he was exaggerating. After that, whenever I was sent out on errands, he would always come with me and pretend to be my husband, a huge risk to us both. If the Mutawa caught us, they would have imprisoned us. He would have gotten it way worse than me, too. He was an amazing person to stick his neck out like that, for an asshole like me. It was 2014, and Valentine's Day was approaching. Like most years, I was single, which was normally fine by me most of the time. However, that year had been a particularly lonely one, with all of my friends at college and me just trying to find my place in the world and what I wanted to do with myself. So reluctantly, I decided to download a few of those dating apps and see if I could meet someone in my area with whom I might have something in common. After a few days, I had gotten a few matches, and one of the girls I was talking to seemed really cool. We shared a lot of the same interests, including our taste in music, and we both liked the same movies, so I figured I would ask her if she might want to see a movie on Valentine's Day, and it would turn out that she wasn't busy, and she said she would love to. To be honest, this was my first supposedly real date on Valentine's Day, so I was pretty nervous, especially since I hadn't actually met this girl before. But we agreed to go and see the Lego movie, so I figured that it would at least be an enjoyable movie, even if the date turned sour. And on Valentine's Day, we both were messaging back and forth trying to figure out when and where we wanted to meet. We eventually decided to meet in the parking lot outside of the Target that was attached to the mall that the theater was in. We also agreed to have dinner after the movie, so I let her know that I needed to stop by the bank on the way to the mall and grab some cash just in case we needed it for some reason. She said that was fine and told me that she would be in a blue Toyota Camry near the far end of the parking lot and to look for the car when I got there. After stopping by the bank, I headed over to the Target parking lot and began scanning around for the blue Camry, and it wasn't hard to find. It was sitting at the very end of the parking lot, with only two cars near it. As I got closer though, I saw that it was empty. Regardless, I pulled up beside it and put my car in park. I took my phone to send her a message asking her where she was, but before I could hit send. My passenger side door swung open and a grown man took a seat next to me. I turned to ask him what he was doing, but then I noticed the gun in his hand. He told me not to make any moves and to just pull out of the parking spot nice and slowly. There was nothing for me to do other than to listen to the man's instructions. As we drove along, he had me turn down back roads and eventually he told me to stop and pull up on the side of the road. I was concerned because of the lack of anything around us. It was only trees. I had yet to see a building on this stretch of the road. Nevertheless, I did what he said and pulled the car over. I told him that he could take whatever he wanted and I asked him just to please not hurt me. That was when he laughed and told me that I was the fourth sucker, as he called it, 
to be scammed by his fake Tinder profile. He then told me that he wanted my wallet, sneakers, and cell phone. And as he drove off in my car, I told myself that I was lucky to be alive. I told the police about the profile he had used, and they said he had used three other very similar profiles to rob other men in the area. They said they were close to catching him, but I haven't heard anything about it since. And that was eight years ago. When I was living in San Diego with a few friends, we all decided to go out to a speed dating event that was hosted monthly at one of the restaurants and bars that we liked to go to, and it ended up being a ton of fun. We ended up meeting some really cool people, and it was a good way to get to know some things about the area from people who had been there a while. So as Valentine's Day was coming up, Sarah, one of my roommates, saw a flyer at the restaurant that they were doing a Valentine's speed dating event. Right away, Sarah, Josh, Katie, and I were all on board. The only person who didn't want any part of it was Justin. But that's because he had a real date to go on that year. But for the four of us, we were going to try to make the best of the day. We got to the restaurant early, filled out all the information and questionnaire that they handed out, and got our name tags before sitting at random tables. And just as we expected, it was a great time, at least for the few first rounds. However, when Katie and I ended up being paired with one another, things changed a bit. Katie seemed a little weird when she sat down, and when I asked her what was wrong, she told me that the last guy she had been paired with kept trying to touch her hands and reaching across the table. She said that he gave her really creepy vibes and just couldn't shake it. I did my best to help her calm down before we ended up switching partners again, and I think I did. But for the rest of the night, I couldn't help but watch the guy that she had gotten so scared of. Right away, I noticed what she was talking about. Almost everyone that he got paired with seemed to come out of the conversation looking like they had just had a near-death experience. They looked so creeped out. However, when the time came for the man to be paired up with my other roommate, Sarah, I noticed something odd. She seemed to be enjoying herself around him. In fact, after the event was over, she told us that she was going to go back to watch a movie at his apartment, to which we all protested. She reminded us that she was an adult though, and said that she was going to hang out for a few hours and then catch a ride home. Reluctantly, we all let her go off with him. Sarah never returned home that night, and the next day we got a visit from the police. A worker at the restaurant we were at that night was throwing out the trash and found Sarah's body tucked behind the dumpster. She had been stabbed in the stomach more than 10 times, and the examiners told her family that there were signs that she had been assaulted beforehand. We pointed the police toward the man that we all know was responsible, but according to them, there wasn't enough evidence to directly implicate him. Cameras in the restaurant saw her leaving with him, but that was it. When they searched his apartment, they found no sign of Sarah having been there. He claims that when they left the restaurant, she began mocking him at the sight of his beat up car, to which he told her that he didn't want to see her anymore and left her there. We don't buy that at all though. Sarah's car was a junker too. She wouldn't have any problems with what anyone else drove. As of right now, Sarah's killer is still out there. Valentine's Day came, so my fiance Tara and I decided to go see a movie and grab something to eat. It was a late movie, so by the time we had gotten out of the theater, it was already around 10 p.m. Both of us were exhausted after working all day, so the plan was just to get into the car and head home, which we did. However, as soon as I stepped into our apartment, I noticed something strange. The light had been left on in the bathroom, which is something we never did. You see, we had a huge window taking up a large portion of our bathroom wall, so during the daytime, it was so bright in there, 
we often never used the light, and when we were in the apartment earlier that day, we wouldn't have had the light on, but I just figured we must have accidentally turned it on or something, as odd as that sounds. I figured it was nothing, so I didn't even bring it up to Tara. We were both too tired to deal with it anyways, so we just got into our pajamas and got ready to fall asleep after an otherwise perfect Valentine's Day. Sadly, the sleep didn't last long. Not long. After I had managed to drift off, I was shaken awake by Tara. I turned to her and she had her finger to her lips telling me to stay quiet. After that, she held up her phone on which she had typed, I hear something under the bed. I remember rolling my eyes because this was something that had happened before and it turned out to be one of the cats. This time was different though because the cats were in the living room. I remember them not wanting to come into the room before I closed the door for the night. So I decided to turn on the flashlight on Tara's phone and take a look to see what might be making this noise that she claimed to hear. I shine the phone light down the crack of the bed along the wall and peer down in the crevice. I had to do my best to not drop the phone because as soon as my eyes adjusted, I noticed that there was an eye looking right back up at me. I rolled as fast as I could and grabbed Tara, ushering her to the door quickly. Once we were out of my room, we went into the bathroom and proceeded to lock and barricade the door. Tara, who had her phone, was calling the police as we heard the sounds of footsteps running through the room and into the hallway. The door handle to the bathroom began to move and I could hear whoever it was trying to force the door open. That was when I yelled for them to get out of here and told them that we were calling the police. They must have taken me seriously because shortly after, I heard footsteps run through our apartment and out of the front door. By the time the police arrived, there was no sign of the intruder. All they found was one of our kitchen knives stashed underneath our bed. The next day, we got a new set of locks on the door and cameras in case anything like that ever happened again.